No? Ah, the microphone is on. So, um, yeah, welcome. So, I'm Pix2 of Still, and today I'm going to talk about operator stacking versus node networks. Or actually, operator stacking and node workfare networks, because that's what we are doing right now. And I will rush through the slides. So, um, well, uh, I did uh, like a couple of demos. Uh, we started with like MAD 2000 something with like a DirectX engine just scripting. And it didn't really work for me because as a designer, I wanted to be colors and stuff. So, and I want to have keyframes. Uh, then we started with tool one and it was like a huge amount of, uh, yeah, of uh, development work. But we did a couple of uh, demos with it. So eventually it paid off. And uh, since a couple of years here, we are working on our new tool, which is called tool two. Um, well, we start from sketch with this one and so, but let's start with operator stacking. So everybody knows operator stacking here. So it's backsoic and uh, for fiber and care set is like fabulous idea. Uh, it's really awesome, we thought. So we basically cloned it like everybody else in the demo scene. And um, so we thought, that, hey, actually operator stacking is the best thing since sliced bread because it like makes like work so tremendously fast. You don't have to tweak around with lines and stuff, but it, uh, it has a couple of disadvantages you discover once you're using them. So one thing is like, um, like you need special operators to have like multiple outputs. With that, you can't have like nesting or like it makes nesting a little bit more complicated. And uh, we always thought that like paging or pages is like a weird thing to structure your, oh, it's getting bright here, um, your, your designs. And I personally, I hate like if elements snap to a grid because it gives me a headache. I want to drag something and it has to supposed to move smoothly. So coming to tool two. So uh, we have like a wish list we collected over the time. We did actually some usability tests. We wanted to have speed up the design process and we want to have like live coding and creative coding. And we looked at a couple of competitors also outside the demo scene. And we started from scratch from the technology point of view, so we wanted to experiment with something new. So uh, let's jump into the tool. Uh, so basically this is what it looks like. Um, it, well, I have to explain, we stack from bottom to the top. So we stack like Lego blocks, not like stacking below. So the, the data flows from bottom to top. And then the idea is basically we thought about a lot with like, okay, how would it be if you could actually combine like stacking with like Loose um, 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 so basically you could rip operators apart if you select them like that, but you can also like snap them together once they are like close enough and then they build like blocks similar to operator stacking. Um, so one thing we could do with that. Example, so once you have like a block, you can move the block around like that. So um, let's quickly build like an operator. So let's say you have a plane. Um, so let's go through some presets here. Then rotate this thing like that. Uh, say like, okay, we want to disable the z-test and we want to um, make some additive blending here, like that. Oh, oh that's the wrong one. Almost there. Um, I'd like to group this thing here. So one thing we could now do is basically take like this block of operators and um, basically combine them into a new group. And let's say we call this one star. So we have a new operator here, just like the other operators. But we can go into this operator and for instance say like, okay, let's assume we want to have like the count of the stars as a parameter. So publish this, say like, way count. And basically now we have a new operator that basically have like a way, way count parameter. And um, we could also like have something like um, do some math here and say like okay the way cone goes into like the divide the number of like let's say 30 and say like the scene repeat we take like the rotation angle onto that so basically that they are evenly distributed so um, 
the nice thing about that is actually it allows me as a designer, which I'm doing, almost there, um, to basically prototype stuff. But once the code is halfway, or like the, the, the functionality is halfway there, you can actually go into things. And for instance, let's say, uh, let's take the, the divide operator as an example. So you can actually go in there, and since it's like C sharp, you have like live editing. So basically, you have a lot of boilerplate code. But actually, in there, there's basically a function that defines like, okay, like just divide like a two incoming parameters. And uh, with that, you can easily, uh, Basically, take the inner part of an operator and basically remove like all this stuff and replace it, for instance, with like really ultra lightning C sharp code that's actually compiled. So um, why I'm actually talking about that is um, so I would like to get we would like to get feedback. So actually, uh, we want to discuss this because we're not only doing that for us, but actually we eventually want other people to use this tool. So uh, whenever you have some minutes time. We are sitting somewhere there where like, the, the power is always not working. And uh, just come to us, talk to us, and uh, discuss about operator stacking and nesting and stuff like that. So this was my six minutes or something. So any questions? So if you're using uh, C Sharp, did you drop support for 64K? Yes. So actually, I should have mentioned it, so tool like one of the reasons we built two one was explicitly to do 64 case. And we did like two more leverage and invoke, I think. And um, basically, uh, like for me, it was the challenge was not really there. So actually, I think like it's once you have like the, the tool ready, like building 64 case actually really straightforward. So like actually generating content is it's not that much of a challenge. And um, but eventually, like building like really beautiful stuff is really problematic because you can't use MP3s, so you don't find like the right musicians, and you can't use like like some sometimes it's just faster to draw something. You can do like almost everything with like procedural stuff, but it just takes time. And uh, I personally, I'm more like I'm more like the creative person. So we decided, okay, let's drop that. And since anybody's like watching demos now on YouTube, then uh, we thought like let's find something to create images, not like safe size. Um, any more questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Seven, and I'm going to talk about rendering Mandelbox fractals faster with cone marching. What is cone marching? It's a way to do ray marching a bit faster by sharing the initial distance estimations between the neighboring pixels. For that, you have to split your shader in two parts. First, you calculate the depth, and only then the color. And the depth is calculated in multiple passes. The first pass is really low resolution, and you double the resolution every pass. Uh, and you use the result of the previous pass as an impute. Um, now, instead of marching along an array until you hit something, you march along a cone until some object intersects the cone. Um, and every time you double the resolution, your cones get thinner and thinner, and that way you get progressively closer to the, to the true depth. Um, demonstration with a one by one uh, pass first. This is our initial uh, distance, and at this point, the size of the sphere is much larger than the tiny size of the cone, so we can continue. We march along the center, and we find the next distance, but this time, the sphere is clearly smaller than our cone, so some object is intersecting the cone, and we halt this pass, we discard the last test, put the distance in the output buffer, start a new pass which is the two pixel, two, uh, pixel pass. You have two cones and you start at the center 
of each cone and you start at the depth from the previous pass. This time the left cone is big enough to continue the right one not. So you uh, halt that one. And yeah, here the next one hits an object, but it's not a final depth pass, so we ignore that. The four pixel pass, um, here almost every cone has to halt immediately, except the third one, which can actually continue until it's out of range. And this means that uh, for one quarter of our pixels, we don't have to do any more work. So we also get a speed up by marching uh, wide empty spaces at a much lower resolution. Uh, the final pass, eight pixels in this example, there you do just usual ray marching until you hit something. Um, in real life, yeah, after the final dead pass, you can do your coloring. But in real life, of course, you don't bother with uh, one by one pixel buffers because um, yeah, the frame buffer and shader switching overhead is going to uh, completely negate any speed uh, advantages. Four to five depth passes is enough, so you should take your starting, res your final resolution and divide by 16 or 32. Uh, how much faster does it help you find the depth? If you think it's important to have exactly the same image as with ray marching, you have to split your um, number of steps, you, your maximum number of steps uh, over all depth passes and this gives you only a 30% speed up. But uh, the low resolution passes are really cheap to calculate. So it's kind of stupid to limit yourself, to, to limit the number of steps you take there. So if you give far more uh, steps at the low resolution passes, you get an additional speed up and you can see further in the, the wide open spaces uh, in your image. And uh, if, um, if precision is not that important to you, you can then lower the amount of steps you take in the final uh, ray marching, and then you get an, a quite big additional speed up. And compared to the original ray marching, you have less precision close by, but you can still see deeper. Here's an example. This is uh, an image with uh, 100 steps with ray marching. It takes about 80 milliseconds for a frame. This is with cone marching. Uh, it looks the same, um, but it's much faster. This is 100 steps at most spread over five passes. This is how it looks with uh, each step, each pass 100 steps. As you can see, we can now see much, much deeper. Now, if we limit the final ray marching pass to 20 steps instead of 100, you will see that we lose a lot of uh, precision close by, but we can still see very deep. And now it takes only 31 milliseconds. So if um, precision close by is not that important, then you can use that. What are the good points of cone marching? It works with every distance function. You don't need to pre-calculate 3D buffers or such. Each frame is completely independent, so you can make your distance function change a lot and use it for animation and stuff and it's small enough to fit in 4K. The downsides are that um, it's only for primary rays, you can't use it to accelerate reflections or shadows, and the um, early out in the wide empty spaces can give visible artifacts if you use iteration glow. Um, yeah, question time I think, so uh, what does it have to do with Mandelbox fractals? Thanks for asking. The distance formula of the Mandel box is not exact. It's an approximation and it errs on the safe side. And that means that when you're doing cone marching and it looks like you're hitting a Mandel box, then it's often safe to continue. So you can uh, cheat by introducing a fudge factor that makes your cone smaller than it should be. Of course, that means that if your distance function happened to be accurate at that point, you're now making errors and punching square holes through the thinner parts of your Mandelbox fractal. But it turns out to be only notice noticeable at the low resolution passes, where you have wide cones and big steps and also big square errors. So you can use different cheat factors for each pass. You cheat very little in the initial pass and a lot in the last. So instead of having a cone, you have a kind of bullet shape. And this is, um, this is with cone marching already. You can see there's a lot of detail here, but not much detail 
in the deeper parts. Uh, I'm not cheating uh, anything at the moment. This is with a lot of cheating. You can see that we can see much deeper, but um, yeah, compared to the previous image, the, you see a lot of corruption. This is with yeah, a lot of cheating at every step. Um, this is with uh, gradual cheating. So we start with one, then two, four, eight, uh, ten. And uh, we can still see quite deep, and the, but uh, the surface close by is not as corrupt. And there's also a small speed up. Uh, original was 134 milliseconds, and uh, now we're at uh, 84 milliseconds. Um, and if you then lower the amount of steps in the, the ray marching, then you're down to 67 uh, milliseconds and the front has lost a lot of detail but you can still see quite deep. So cone marching, cone marching allows you to make trade-offs between speeds, seeing, distance and yeah, render artifacts. Uh, I'm going to put a longer version of this presentation on our website. Uh, I don't know if there's time for questions, otherwise uh, ask me uh, at the party hall. Thank you. <laughs> Is it time for the next one already? Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tomasz Swaina. I'm also known as Docs from DCS. I'm developer from MDEV team and I want to say a few words about the main project because this year is 50th anniversary. So I want to say about the past, present and future of the project. Also I want to say a few words why people are contributing to the project and why people are lasting the projects. So let's, let's start from the beginning. What's my purpose of the project? My purpose is uh, to preserve old games, old gaming from being forgotten and lost. It's not to play the games, just to make some documentation. All the project is open. It has access to all the files, all the archives. And uh, if you really want to play the games, you can play in main because the side effect of the project is ability to play some of the games, but not all and not at the level you want to play. Alternatives out there are a couple different. You can buy a pack of games, remakes, ports of current computers or current uh, home con consoles. Or even if you're rich enough, you can start collecting original games and PCBs and play original games. And it's the best, best, best feeling, but it's a really expensive one. So, as you can see, tell, I want to bore you to that with some information about the high story of the project. It started in 1997 by Italian developer Nicola Salmoria, and since then we reached a couple of important milestones. For example, we emulated um, vector games, laser disc games, there's a funny history with gambling games because they were removed and given back later because uh, we changed the mind because it's in fact it's part of amusement and, and all the world of arcades. Also, Pong, it was very interesting history because, because Pong wasn't uh, uh, emulated, it was only a simulator of the game for playing, not for documenting, not for storing information how the hardware is done. So it was completely removed, not that level of abstraction was achieved. We also added uh, uh, discrete sound, on sound emulation, not based on uh, normal chips, just on parts, logical parts that generating sound in other hardware. And another big milestone was switching from C to C++ modern coding. But the uh, whole project it depends and runs on mostly on macros. It's not directly coding in programming language, but using some special designed macros that in fact helping a lot the development process, but make it sometimes more complex. So as you, as you can see, number of games usually increase in time because we are not removing games, just adding games to the projects, but the number of active developers 
is uh, varying over time. And the question is why? Why people are, for example, leaving the project? And the question uh, is simple and answer is even more simple because it has a real life. They uh, have family, started education, got a better job, or just wanted to emulate a few games and when the goal was reached and just left the project. But however, we also know a few people that are found much better and much more interesting hobbies like this. And move that, that kind of hobbies and we lost a couple of good developers from the team. So the opposite question is why people want to uh, contribute to the project? Why? What, what's the reason to emulate the game or, or preserving from being lost or forgotten? Because it's something like hacking. It's big fan of uh, reverse engineering and uh, looking how all hardware was done, what is designed, who and how uh, prepared all the solutions and how it works. And, mm, for an example of the hardware, I will show something made by MicroPro Software. You probably know MicroPro Software from making games for 8 and 16-bit computers like Commodore 64 and Amiga. They made a lot of games from MicroPro Soccer to Sid Meier's strategic game and a couple of uh, flying simulators. And yes, uh, 22 years ago, they also designed a very complex uh, hardware. I don't want to enumerate the parts on the slide, just show it's complex. There's a lot of processor, uh, vector processors, because it's three-dimensional hardware, completely made from custom parts, rasterizer, and mathematical stuff. And it's what, how to emulate that, that kind, how to document and emulate that kind of hardware. And usually there are two ways. One is very easy and, uh, and simple because uh, in that way you have all the documentation or access to the hardware. You know everything about the game. You have schematics, you have access to real hardware when you can run uh, some uh, try on programs on the board to see how it works. You can try its connection on the board or have some reference photos on videos. But it's... Mm, it's not so often. Most, most, more obvious, most often way is very hard part when you have nothing, no information. You even not, don't know how the game look like. You only have some di data extracted from the mind board. You even don't know what kind of processor is inside, and you have to research everything from scratch, checking upcodes, checking the memory regions, and other things. So, to help uh, in, in that process. Uh, there's a couple of ways. First, uh, project name include, for example, debugger disassembler for all supported processors from 4 bits to 64 bits disassemblers to file debuggers with uh, conditional and under conditional breakpoints, memory viewer, uh, graphical viewer. There are also other projects that are not connected with MAME, like dumping onion, the capping project, and connected like MAME testers, people that are testing all uh, every relays of the projects and reporting back to our team and we are trying to fi fix them or not. And of course a lot of people that are contributing to the project, there's, mm, there's no need to be inside in the project, a member of the project to help, to uh, support us. You, external contributions are very often people fixing bugs, sending information about the games, uh, picture screens of some memories when they play the game, how it looks like, how to play, what's wrong, color are wrong or something, something, and we are going to fix that. So, continuing on the game, it's F15 uh, Strike Eagle Simulator. And first stage of emulation, we reach its static two-dimensional screen. Some graphic is missing, but the three-dimensional part is not here. We can only see some graphic and action is uh, place, 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 uh, placing action. is Everything looks like playable. You can fly, but you will kill it in a few minutes because everything is black. So, the next step was to emulating mathematical hardware, the floating point units and special AMD uh, RISC processor to get something, some data that could be displayable on screen. And we displayed some uh, dots in place on vertices without uh, the real rasterization and it was looking like this. It looks like a uh, game to connect dots, but it's really, the game was playable at the time, just looking at dots, what's going on the screen. And um, after a couple of next months, we, because it took a lot of time, we get to the final screen with final graphic rasterization, completely custom code, completely custom hardware, not based on anything that is uh, in production. It touched the mind effort of emulating. It's just, uh, it's very fun because um, you see the results of your work. You see 
uh, how the grain progressing, the emulation progressing, and reaching the point when it's playable and when it looks uh, as the real hardware game, as the real game from uh, owned by collectors. So the last question is, what's the future of the project? The future of the project is unknown. What in fact, it's just uh, adding more games, emulating more games on different level, because we are going deep into the structure, maybe not into the quantum level, but close. And it's like with uh, send demos, because uh, if you have a demo with pre-calculated graphic on FS, for example, rotating balls or something, like in technological debt for Amiga, all demo, there were tons of balls bouncing on screen, but all of them were, were animation pre-calculated, and it wasn't so impressive. It's the same in emulation, because you have, for example, uh, old Namco games, Galaga, was very good emulated years ago, and if you run it, Nowadays, it runs much slower than previously because we are went much deeper in emulating every custom chips on the board. Previously, we have, for example, sampled sound and explosion sound was played one from a sample. It was just wave file that was explosion. And later, we discovered that it's produced by a microcontroller on the board that is generating white noise and modulating the white noise to making some impression of explosion. So we went in that deep, emulated another processor in the set, and we got the same effect, in fact, because noise was uh, exactly the same as the sampled one, but it's documentation. It's not to play games, and we reached the point where we know more about the uh, project, about the game, and it's available in the south so everyone can have access to it and check or improve on the use in own projects. That's all. Any questions? Hello. Yeah. Um, uh, lately you have not only uh, reintroduced uh, gambling games but also pinballs uh, and I've seen also a lot, of, a lot of other new stuff. Don't you fear this is going to make the project uh, um, crumble, uh, becoming a lot of spaghetti code? It's hard to say. The, the main reason of adding uh, pinball games was not emulating the pinball games and pinball tables, just a part of electronic part, displaying or, or sound hardware. Sometimes it's, it's shared with other games. For example, uh, Gottlieb has sound hardware that is also used in other platforms, so we want to just reuse the part of the code in typical arcade games. Same for gambling games. Many, many, many gambling games run on hardware designed for arcade games and vice versa. So it's more likely uh, at this stage of development of the project to help us uh, emulating other games that sharing some parts with pinballs and uh, gambling games. One last question I said before, uh, one went, okay? I said before that we removed Pong because it was simulation, and the NEV direction for MAME is emulating all the discrete hardware games without CPU, the game from the poor Pong age, and that's the way to go. It's another set of games that is not emulated correctly and re required completely different approach because there's no CPU, just logic chips connected and very varies on timing. Okay. Um, I'm a bit, a bit disappointed that uh, there are no DOS or uh, Linux ports anymore for uh, quite a while. Can we expect to have some native uh, hardware PC versions for, for DOS or uh, Linux uh, in the future? Or is it bound to Windows so do you have to uh, have the DirectX stuff, etc.? Yes, uh, in fact, the uh, project is developed mostly on PC. But it works without any problems on OS X. I'm using OS X for developing main project. And it's uh, basically used to other people from outside ETM. We are only care about the core, and it can be ported to any platform by other people who want to do. We, 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 can't, we can't focus on all aspects, on our platforms. And one of the, of the reasons why people are leaving uh, the project is for someone who worked on the Linux based Linux version and he just lost the effort in making correct port. Yes, so you are relying on OpenGL to be existent on the host platform. But yes. If you're going deep into the hardware emulation, it would be logical to emulate the GL processing chips as well. Yes, yes. Put it on a really low level hardware because to me, I, I, cannot, I don't want to have an arcade machine 
that needs to, to load and uh, needs to uh, be powered down, shutting down arcade machine. That's not a, a way for me. I, I, I think I am the last person to, to have support in the DOS board because if, yes. if I want to stop playing, I just go to switch it off. But I pull the plug and this is uh, what I uh, think an uh, 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 arcade machine has to yes. work like. Yes, I agree with you that the DOS pod was really the, the, the best one to put in the arcade cabs. But also some people just dropped that idea of developing in TES. It's possible with OpenGL or DirectX libraries to make this pocket version of MAME. For example, they st someone stoned the version on releasing a multi games pack. But it's a bit obsolete. There's no, 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 no synchronization with the latest version. So I think it's also a good direction to go because people want something else. And we, it's not a project to make only for no one, but for people. And if someone requesting DOS version or Linux version, then we should go in that direction. Yeah, I, will try. I, will, I will try to kick someone in, you know what. Yeah, at, least, at least the Linux version that is stable. OK. It's our, yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm Krusty from Benediction, and I will give you an overview of the CPC demo scene in this talk called Inglorious Amstar. So, what is an Amstrad CPC? It's a machine of almost 30 years old with a Z80 CPU at, five, at 4 megahertz. Uh, 128 kilobytes of RAM, only 64 kilobytes can be used for the graphics. Uh, the machine has a palette of 27 colors with three different uh, resolutions. With the low resolution screen, you can use up to 16 colors. With the medium resolution, you can use four colors. And with the high resolution, you can use two colors. So I will give you the, the strengths of the CPC. Uh, there are no color constraints in the images. You can use uh, 16 different colors in every pixels. No limitations on that. There is a very high resolution mode with the two colors. You can see it in the uh, Batistem bat uh, part of the Batman Forever demo. Uh, there is a very fast integrated floppy disk drive and the floppy controller can also uh, be connected to PC drives. Uh, there are two, two chips to control the graphics, the CRTC uh, allowed to control the geometry of the screen and the synchronization uh, information of the monitor and another one controls the colors and the modes. But there are several problems with the Amstrad CPC. The communication between the CPU and the peripherals is very slow. We have no hardware sprite, no fine horizontal scrolling, uh, the memory screen is not linear. The pixel encoding is very weird. Uh, and the CPU is always slowed down to, to, to display the graphics. I will give you a fast and an accurate view of the demos since the beginning. 
Um, I have put screenshots of the main demos of the various periods. So at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 19s, it was the period for discovering all the hardware tricks. Everything was discovered at this moment. Uh, sadly, people mainly does not understand what they were doing and uh, they were copying each other what the other, the other do with, without mastering these tricks. These tricks are yet used now. Uh, and the, the, the main group was the Logan, Logan system. After there was a period with uh, not a lot of interesting things, gods were gone. Uh, there were still demos, but uh, with no novelties. German people did high technical but ugly things. French did good things but with not technical code. Uh, but there was nothing really interesting at, at this period. Uh, several mega demos were, were released at, at this, this moment, but with no, no novelty. At the beginning of the second century, things became more interesting. Several world records were broken. Uh, new gods appeared, and uh, the, the main group at the, this period was Overlanders. There was another not interesting period with almost no, no demos. Uh, there was a ball contest as uh, for the Atari ST. Uh, I do not remember the first release. 22 dots? No? 20, 20, 20 balls. 20 balls for the first participant. 42 for the last one. Uh, it has not yet been broken. Uh, there were almost no novelties too. And we are now where uh, complexity of demos increase, there are new effects, there are mainly multi-part demos. Uh, I forget to say that uh, until two, 2000 demos were logo, effect, scrollers. 90% of demos on uh, CPC are like that. Other scheme are almost novelties. Since, two, since three or four years, it's never, never like that. Uh, so we have mainly multi-part demos. One track more since uh, last year with Batman Forever. And a new world record are being broken. And there is yet better to, to appear. So if you are interested to the CPC, there are several user groups. Uh, national and international user groups, uh, but the, they are mainly user centric with a low signal to noise ratio. It's hard to follow, there are too many posts. Uh, it's ma mainly for eBay user and retrogramming people. Uh, I'm more interested for the demo center centric website. There is now one named Push and Pop uh, with technical forums uh, as the others, but you can, you can ask questions about demo related things and have accurate answer quite quickly. There are demo center related news, party reports, and a higher signal to noise ratio in the content of the message in the forum. Shit. Uh, now, it will be the, the last slide. I will talk about the CPC events. Since more than 20 years, CPC people often meet themselves. You have uh, an historic of all these events uh, in, a, in a page of CPC Wiki. Since few years, CPC guys also go to not CPC specific parties like Forever, Main, Evoke, Revision. Uh, they also release uh, production at this party, but they are never appreciated. <laughs> uh, 
there is, there is a CPC only party, which is called Reset, uh, in France uh, in June. Uh, in this party, there are several contests, demo contests, intro contests, graphics contests, music contests, contests, and you can uh, send remote productions. So if you're interested to participate, feel free to register at the address at the bottom. Uh, have I a bit of time? <coughs> have you got questions? Hi. Could you tell us something about CRTC differences and uh, what about CPC plus scene? It is uh, uh, divided from normal CPC scene or how it is? Okay, so thanks, Factor 6. There are different CRTCs on the CPC, uh, the graphical chip, and uh, they are more or less compatible together. So one demo which works for one CRTC may not work for the other CRTCs. In the, at the beginning of the 90s, it was very current to have uh, badly programmed demos which does not work everywhere. But now we are trying to pay attention to to have demos working everywhere. We adapt our code when it's possible. But some effects are possible only on some kind of CRTCs. That's why some demos can work only on CRTC1, for example. And there is another machine named Amstrad Plus, which is a, a kind of CPC uh, with uh, no CRTC, uh, instead, it has uh, uh, something called an ASIC, which emulates the CRTC and runs a bit differently and allows uh, uh, fine hardware scoring, I think. It has hardware sprites. Uh, colors of the sprites can be different on color of the screen. Uh, there are DMA for sounds, uh, maybe other things, uh, maybe for, for uh, I, do not, I do not really know this machine. Uh, the same people working for um, Amstrad Plus or in the scene of the CPC, there are no, uh, no Amstrad, old Amstrad scene and no, no Amstrad Plus scenes, but there are no productions for the Amstrad Plus. I think there are two demos. I think. No, I, I do not think there are. Okay, there are two good demos, three, three, three good demos. But that's all. Is it okay? Uh, just, just your your opinion. Is the hardware hardware fully understood, or, or is there still some potential for discovering new features of the hardware, leading to new effects? What do you uh, think? I will discover nothing, but I think there are a lot of things to discover. Yes, can you confirm? Yes, there are a lot of things to discover uh, with CRTC, but also with sound. I think. Well, we have done nothing with sound on Atari ST. We have the same chip as uh, Spectrum and Atari ST. And we, on the Atari ST, they do marvelous things with the sound, and we do nothing uh, interesting like that. <laughs> Whereas we can. OK, so I have no, no more time. We can talk. Uh, <laughs> out. Okay. Well, my four-year seminar is uh, how not to suck at pinball. <laughs> um, before we start, um, 
I would like put in some naming conventions because I'll be mentioning them. You have the outlays left and right, the inlays left and right, you have the lane guides, the slingshots, the flippers, the drains, and more lane guides and more blinker lights. This is on. No, it is. Sorry, I leave it here. Okay. Um, yeah, the uh, scoop. Can I have another cable? This is broken. <laughs> yeah, and then when I when I falls on the floor, <laughs> I'll just hold it. Whatever. Uh, so first things first. Um, what not to do? Don't do a flip. Just when the ball is coming, don't slap like a penguin and try to save it. It's, uh, it doesn't work. No, I wait, for, I wait for you. Anyway, uh, so don't do a flip, that's one thing. And also, don't do nothing. Uh, pinball is a game of skill. Um, if, you, <laughs> if, you just let, if you just let gravity win, you're going to lose. <laughs> you have to... Hello? I like somebody playing with you. <laughs> with your balls of steel? <laughs> and they're shiny, so... <laughs> Okay, so don't do nothing. It's it's you have to you have to move the machine. It is an industrial apparatus. I'm not counting the latest stern ones, but that you can shift around and kick, and it can survive it. Don't do it, but it can survive it. So um, now we you have you are in control. So to be in control, you have to read, aim, push, cradle, bounce, pass, wall pass, tip pass, life catch, drop, stop, slap, slap, and be zen about it. <laughs> Basic skills, epically. Read the fucking manual. <laughs> every, every pinball game in the corner has the rules which explain what to do when. Not everything, but most of it. So always look for the little cardboard if it's there for a reason. Now, and then you have to aim. Mind you that if you, the further down the ball is on the flipper, the other direction it will go. And take that into account that the speed also matters. So a ball going slowly at, at the same point will go in a different direction uh, if, it is, if it's, this is moving there fast. Um, if you want some advanced stuff, you can backhand, meaning that normally from the left flipper you shoot at the stuff on the right. If you do it slowly, you can shoot for stuff on the left. And then the ball will also go more slowly, meaning that you will have more chance to control it should things fuck up. Um, up push. Um, when you have the slingshots, you will see the ball go tick, 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 and then in the, in the outside, the, in the out lane. <laughs> you don't want that, so if, it, if at the moment it touches the rubber, give it a little push, it will take away the momentum, and with some luck the ball will wobble down and you can get control again. If you push too hard, you actually help, and the ting thing doesn't last as long and you lose the ball faster. So then there we come to uh, the cradle. Uh, cradle is basically stopping the ball. It's uh, put, uh, put up a flipper, catch the ball there, let it roll down, and aim for whatever you want to. Now, getting to the cradle, that's the hard part, which we'll do uh, right now. Um, if you um, want more advanced skills, when you have a multi-ball, try to cradle one or two balls and just play around with the one remaining. <laughs> Um, if you take, for instance, um, the Congo game which we have here, doing, doing multi-ball when you have uh, the jackpot on the ramp in the back, just keep on shooting it and you will have four jackpots before the diverter kicks in and puts the ball on the other flipper. So if you block one on the left one with the right one, you can just keep on looping. So the semi-advanced skills um, are the bounce pass. It's a bit of doing nothing, but yet you, you do something. Um, when the ball comes down to your flipper, you give it a little push and it should bounce over. Don't forget that the flippers are coated with a rubber ring. It's bouncy. And they will go to the other side where you can flip it up and cradle if it goes far enough. If not, it will go a lot slower and you can control the ball to wherever you want it to be. The wall pad is something similar. If it rolls down the in-lane, hold up the flipper, it will roll over it, fly over the Hall of Doom, and arrive at the other side. If you, if you say, fucking God, I'm not going to make it, you can, at, at, the, at the very tip, and it's uh, quite advanced, and, um, well, your first 20 attempts will see the ball flying away, um, is at the, at the very tip, just let, let, 
of your flipper button, let it go a little bit, that it drops a millimeter, and then reactivates, it gives a little extra push, and it will get to the other side without any problem. <laughs> That's the uh, tip pass. Do we have a table after that? Challenge me, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the post pass is from a cradle. Uh, picture that you have your um, ball stuck on the left flipper, but you want it on the right. What you do is, you drop your left flipper, you raise it again, and then, of course, this slingshot is also coated by rubber. Um, the, uh, the ball will then hit the rubber, bounce over to the other side, and if done correctly, you can cradle it over there again. If not correctly, the ball is everywhere. Mostly in the out lane. So, the quite advanced skills, the live catch, meaning that at the, when the ball is racing down, you flip up so that at exactly the same time that the flipper is at the full up position and the ball touches it, the momentum will cancel each other out and the ball will just calmly roll down. You can catch it and uh, aim for whatever you want. Um, other variation of this is the drop stop, meaning that you um, see that I say this correctly because it's uh, hard to uh, mix the two up. All right. Um, you will, um, you have your flipper up when the ball is coming down. At the same point, the ball touches the flipper. You drop the flipper and it will like wobble a bit around, slow down a bit, and you can aim for something else. If you miss this, I think the result is obvious. Your ball is gone. And then the uh, slap save. See a lot of arrows. <laughs> Now you see, I do suck at paint.net, that's what I made. <laughs> um, it's, um, let's see, um, ball is coming down, and it's not aimingly, aiming clear for one of the flippers. So, but you can give it with one flipper, give it a small nudge to the side, so that it will be in range of the second flipper, so you go left, right, or right, left, in very, not, not together, but in a, a very, uh, close time up and then the ball will zoom up again. You are not aiming for anything. This can go either way, but you will have a chance to regain control afterwards. Um, um, sliding the machine a bit helps to help the extra push to put it uh, underneath. That's uh, a Chardonnay. We'll come to that later. And then there's the nudge. As said, you can, you can push the machine. This is the solution of doing nothing. If you see the ball going for a place you don't, you don't want to, you can shove it and um, basically um, if you um, go in the opposite direction of the ball, you will bounce it away in that direction. If you go in the same direction, you will uh, ease out, uh, you will uh, cancel out momentum and be able to rescue it. So uh, for instance, if the ball is going towards the wall, you basically slap the wall against the ball and it will fly into the mystery zone. If you uh, see that it's going like almost for the in-lane, you can push the in-lane under the ball and it will slide in. And as I said, don't do nothing. Well, sometimes you do nothing. Uh, some, 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 some machines have, have, have a little post in the middle of the flippers and with nerves and balls of steel, you can just do nothing and have faith in your random deity and say, pops, the ball will go back up and we'll see what happens from there. Now, of course, there are some things you are not supposed to do. And um, I don't uh, suggest that you do them because uh, if people see them do them on their machines, they will kick you. <laughs> First of all is the bang back, <laughs> meaning that if the ball goes through the outline lane, you have the metal guide, it's the apron, uh, underneath where the ball disappears on. Um, well, it's made of metal and it doesn't really bounce, but if you kick the machine hard enough, <laughs> it should, it can go up and uh, back into the play field. And actually some, some pinball machines award you a, a, a hidden bonus for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a data he's rocky and bullwinkle if you if you hit, uh, there are uh, contacts in the out lanes. If you hit, uh, if you hit this switch, and afterwards you hit hit another one on the play field, um, it will give you like uh, a very well done bonus of a couple of millions. <laughs> and uh, 
Then we have the uh, Chardon again, uh, which is named for a friend of mine, Vincent Chardon, who does it all the time on every machine, and uh, I, I kick him. Uh, but it, it's um, a bit hard to see here, but the ball goes straight down the middle, FTDMs. Um, nothing to do with it, but what you do is you take the machine and you slide it underneath the ball. <laughs> and actually, if you, if you do it fast and hard enough, you will not get a tilt warning. Um, it, uh, it's, uh, we have our regular meetings um, in bars, and one of our friends is the operator of the machine, who owns the machines. And, if you, and, 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 and when Vincent, and also his son, slides the machine 20 centimeters to the side, you see the guy <coughs> freeze up. Well, it's, it's worse. Um, Vincent himself has a demolition man at home, which is also here, and he, yes, he uses the handles on the side. So, uh, um, <laughs> I don't, I absolutely do not suggest that you try this, <laughs> or I will kick you. <laughs> it depends on where you want to land. <laughs> okay, so um, of course, then getting the better scores and understanding the entirety of the machine is again we tools, really. So um, then you have all the blinking lights. Uh, you have, you, you, you have, you have, they, have, they have three statuses or stati. Um, you're off, they're blinking, or they're on. Off means there's nothing here. Go away. Don't even try. Well, you can do it, but there will be no, well, nothing to, to gain. Blinking says, hey, hello, here, I'm here. You can get something. Um, shoot me, please. And on is, yeah, well, I have that. It's, it's best to see if you have, if you take um, the Congo, for instance, you have, um, I think on the ramp you have uh, five green lights, and you will see that the more times you take the ramp, that one lamp will stay on, and the second one above will be blinking like, hey, there is stuff over here. Your, your jackpot will blink, your lock will blink, etc. cetera. Um, of course, there are every light, every blinking lights. <laughs> so what do you do? I know it's getting boring, but you have to read the rules. <laughs> And you can then learn to um, uh, combine stuff. Um, say, if you have, um, yeah, this, this is, um, if you please believe it or not, but uh, on uh, an, an Adams family, when you start uh, Mamushka, which is basically everything counts for a shitload of points that you hit, uh, and then you start the multiball, you will have a Mamushka going with three balls and have more, those things you can get from the rules. And that is uh, what lets you beat your friends. Also not him. So, read the rules again, and um, this is something, uh, multi-ball stealing, not as easy anymore on the current machines, but um, you can do it, it's say, um, if, if there, there are balls already locked by other players, and then you just have to start the multi-ball, and they have done the work for you. Um, it's um, most modern machines compensate by software. Uh, what's the trick to see if, it, if you can do it, if you have, an automatic ball launcher, like a button to uh, launch the ball, or uh, the ball, the game can kick ball into play automatically. The software will compensate. On the older models, from the up to the mid '80s, uh, you can easily steal uh, multi balls. Of course, that means if you are the player whose um, <coughs> pun intended balls get stolen, you, um, you you have to relock them, of course, and do all the work again. So um, it's um, it's a bit of strategy, but it's. Uh, it can be fun to do. Um, also, on the Adams family, it's very easy to relock your balls. Uh, just uh, plunge very slowly and uh, let them add into the swamp. The swamp holds two balls, and the third one uh, just gets uh, kicks, kicked out, and you can start your multi ball. And aim by not aiming. The thing is that there are always various things right in the center of your pinball machine, your play field, that you have to hit. You will have the big blinking light, start multi-ball here or lock balls here. When you aim for it and you shoot it, your ball will be gone. Good example is Whitewater, where you have, um, in order to activate the ball lock, at the very top, you have two green lights next to an entry point for um, higher uh, stuff. Um, if you dare to shoot at those targets, your ball will be gone. So the thing is, you have to aim next to it, but with the side of the ball, hit it a little bit so it will trip the, the switch and it, it will become active and um, register anyway. And, um, well, I think that was the very basis. Uh, 
you can now try out a lot of shots. <laughs> uh, questions? I see someone scratching his hair, but there was not raising a hand. Okay, thank you.